Chameleon Academy and everybody out there in the chameleon world. Today we have on Michael Nash. Michael? <laughs> Hello. Uh, Good to see everyone. And Michael has done some incredible things uh, in the community, just in the, the things that he's explored and the things that he's doing. And so we definitely wanted uh, to bring him back on. Uh, he's been on the uh, podcast before, but uh, this is his first live session. Oh, uh, Once again, welcome, Michael, back to the podcast. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me again. And uh, so everybody, this is the, the way it's going to work is uh, I'm going to go through a uh, presentation that uh, Michael and I will be talking about bioact using bioactive for chameleons. And once we get through that, uh, that presentation, the, the, all these visual guides, so it's easier for you to see what's going on. Then we're going to open it up to question and answer session. And so uh, you go ahead and enjoy the chat. Uh, uh, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, but please, uh, any questions, save it till the question and answer session, uh, because I'm actually not going to see these questions until that time and I can't scroll through everything. So just save them until I say, all right, questions. And then please, please interact. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get right into this. Okay, folks, let's, here we go. Let's see how that, uh... yeah, we're gonna do that. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we go. All right. Welcome. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the topic of today is using bioactive with chameleons with a special consideration for uh, using them for chameleon hatchlings. And uh, Michael has been uh, doing some pretty impressive things in the community and working with some species that we usually don't see. Uh, one of the most notable things he's done is worked with Triocerus eliotai. And uh, you can see those guys in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, they're a very charming live-bearing species. But the significant thing is that uh, he started a community. He's uh, started with an, a number of bloodlines and is slowly working on building out a breeding community uh, so we can establish this in captivity. And so that's the, the initial reason why he came to my attention and came to this podcast, but then uh, all the other things he's doing. Uh, so he, we, we had to br bring him back on for some of those other things. Uh, but Michael, please introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, thanks so much again for having me on, Bill. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so I'm Michael. Um, I'm uh, currently an MD-PhD student at Colorado. And although uh, my keeping of chameleons is sort of something I do for fun on the side, I've been really trying to learn more about them over the time I've kept them. And uh, yeah, I, it's really fun having them around. I try to focus on kind of rare or uncommon species because I think that studying species that are less well known really teaches you a lot about generally keeping chameleons and some of the more commonly available ones as well. So looking at the different species, I find it increases my overall understanding of just how these animals operate. And I find that really interesting and it helps me appreciate the diversity of life. Um, so yeah, I, I really like chameleons, happy to talk about them. I'll try to Kind of keep on topic today, but uh, I could jabber <laughs> on about them for hours. <laughs> He's actually let me know that that's my job is to keep this thing on the rails. <laughs> and I know exactly how that is. Well, I wanted Michael to give us a, a brief introduction to some of the more uncommon species he works with. And so, Michael, let's uh, let us know a little bit about these these guys here. Sure. Um... Which one should I start with? Uh, Elliot's chameleons or that? Yeah, we, we, we're going to have a little bit more in depth on Campania and, Len and Lenotum. So let's mm. just start with Eliota and do the bottom two. All right. Well, happy to. Yeah, they're, um, they're a really fascinating and stunning species. I've been very happy to work with them. Um, they're rather small, which I think generally makes a pretty good pet chameleon. Um, when they're a bit smaller, they're easier to fit in your house. And when you give them a large enclosure, 
uh, it's really fun to watch them explore. But what I really like about them is their personality. Uh, in general, I find that the females tend to be very, very friendly, easy to have around, uh, you know, will never bite or hiss at you. Males are maybe a little bit more skittish, but pretty similar. Um, but what's interesting about them is they inhabit a rather wide range and they're quite adaptable. You don't see them at super, super high elevations. They're a little bit more of a lowland, but uh, still montane. And I think what that translates to in captivity is some good adaptability. Um, so I found that they're actually somewhat tolerant of a range of conditions. And uh, I found they make a really fun species to have around. Plus, they give live birth, which is always fun. No incubation. Um, I think they just make a really good chameleon for more people to get interested in um, for all those reasons. So they're one of my favorites. I really enjoy keeping them. And also, they come in a wide variety of colors, which is rather interesting. Now, you do seem to have a uh, a shift towards the smaller species of chameleons. Do you work with any larger uh, bodied species? I do. Yeah, I um, I have panthers, just a pair, um, which is fun. Um, I really like them. They're from Colorado chameleon, makes a really nice red body. Uh, and uh, I, I had a couple of veils. For a while, I really enjoyed the veils. You know, some people might have different experiences with them, but I really like them. Uh, in addition to that, I have some uh, Parsonite Christopher, and I have two females that I raised from pretty small size. Um, and I've really, really enjoyed keeping those. Those are the biggest I have. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking hard for a male right now. I, so I have two females, but that's probably the biggest species I work with currently. Okay. And let's see, I wanted to go uh, special, uh, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to specifically look at Fursifer Campani because that's a, a, a species we don't usually see, but man, what a gorgeous chameleon. Yeah, I, these are, uh, definitely. I mean, I'll, <laughs> I always say, oh, this is one of my favorites. Those are one of my favorites. And it, it gets old, I'm sure, because most <laughs> things are my favorite when <laughs> it comes to chameleons. But I, I think that these are a really special species. And one reason in particular I'm, I'm focusing on them is because they are currently available. Um, it, they're, they're getting imported. And at any minute, that could totally stop. So I think it's really worthwhile to focus on what we have available. Um, but separate of that, which can apply to many species, I think these have maybe been one of the funnest species I've ever kept. And it's because they have a small size. They have fascinating character to them. Uh, they're really, really good hunters. Uh, they'll just chase around fruit flies all day. I think they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it, Part of what drew me to them is that it's been typically rather difficult to reproduce them or, you know, raise them up and we don't see them around very often. Um, and so I thought trying to keep them might be a good test of my husbandry parameters in a way, since you don't see them very often. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, they're, oh man, I, I, I think I will talk at length about them, perhaps <laughs> at a later point. Yeah, I this is sounding dangerous. Those. It is very dangerous, but uh, one for thing, the guy who's supposed to be the timekeeper, I'm thinking, uh oh, <laughs> what did I open up? <laughs> I guess I'll focus on just one kind of interesting aspect of them and then we can maybe continue. But they come from rather harsh environments in Madagascar. And I, I won't preface that by saying I've never been to Madagascar. I wish I have, but I've soaked up every resource I could possibly get my hands on to get a better feel of where they come from. And uh, really, it's quite remarkable what these animals deal with in the wild because they inhabit sort of montane savanna regions that are interrupted by boulders with kind of maybe some shrubs intermixed in there. And it gets cold at night. It gets you know down to maybe near freezing. Um, mm. And the fact that a small, beautiful animal like this it manages to survive in conditions where it's getting super cold every night. It's very exposed. They're in the savanna grasses and everything. It, it just it adds beauty to this animal to me that it's something with such an impeccable, perfect form uh, lives in such a what I would consider a harsh environment. And that just makes them even more special. So 
I love them. Uh, they've been a real joy to work with. Okay. The next one is uh, Kaluma Linotum. This is a charming little guy. Uh, <laughs> just give us a brief overview about him. Right. So another one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so these are interesting because traditionally these have been rather hard to, it, when they come into this country, it's hard to know what they are because there's a number of other small Kaluma species. Um, and for those of you that might not know, Kaluma is the same genus as Parsons. So these are really tiny and there's a group of very tiny Kaluma species. And I find that very interesting that it's the same group as the gigantic Parsons chameleons, but I digress. Um, so they, it's hard to identify them on import sometimes because there's many other species that look a lot like them. Um, what makes this one stand out compared to the other species that are brought in, like the Kaluma bokeri or, or loco or phallix and so on, is that these have blue noses. Um, and it, it's really quite striking and it's, it's very... <laughs> It's very charming. Uh, anytime I post a picture of them, people compare them to, you know, Pinocchio, the, the nose <laughs> is yeah. quite identifiable. Um, but as far as keeping them, um, I found that they're actually rather hardy once acclimated, if given the appropriate conditions. And what I mean by that is, as we'll go into later, appropriate microclimates um, to survive in. So I think this is an example of a species where in order to keep them successfully, one needs to really, really be aware of what they are like in the wild, where they spend their time. And I think it's very hard to remove them from that environment. So I think the key to keeping these species is really, or this species, I should say, is to try very hard to know what they experience in the wild and recreate that. Um, so it's it's another good test of, uh, for a keeper, I think, because you need to get their habitat right for them to do well. Yeah. Now, one reason why I'm bringing on these obscure species is that Michael's been able to be successful with these species. And so it, it's very important for those of us interested in chameleon husbandry to look into what is it that he's doing that could contribute to this success. And one of the big major things that he's doing is he's working with bioactive enclosures. And so uh, we want to explore bioactive and seeing what it can do for those of us in chameleon husbandry. And so, Michael, let's just start off at the basics of what is bioactive? I mean, is it just dirt and plants? Is, does, do we need uh, do we need isopods? What is it? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really, really important question to address because I think people might have different ideas as to what bioactive really means to them. <laughs> it's almost mm -hmm. up for interpretation in some ways, but the way I would define it is essentially creating a space where there is an ecosystem occurring that has as many components of that ecosystem that are advantageous for the animal that you can provide. So, in addition to that, there's also the benefit of, well, being a system like that, in some ways, it sort of takes care of itself and takes care of the animal. So I suppose I define it as a collection of parameters that allows the animal to have as many choices as possible while maintaining a sort of closed ecosystem. Um, so this means not just a plant and dirt necessarily, but little bugs that break down the waste matter, you know, decomposing plant material, uh, things you would expect to find in the forest, and then having that all work together to create a living system. Um, I suppose that's how I'd, I tend to think about it. Okay. Well, the very next question is, uh, why do we chameleon people care about bioactive? Chameleons live in the trees. Why is the ground important? Right. So I view the ground, so I have a couple responses to that. Uh, I think the ground is important because given the limitations we have in captivity of keeping these animals, adding a space where there's more going on and there's a humidity gradient and, and there's just more in the system, that's one of our tools we have available to us that enables us to 
provide more to the animal. So I think naturalistic approaches are really useful and I, and I go by them, but given uh, the limitations in captivity, adding the bioactives component provides more for the animal to utilize. So I don't have access to multiple trees, right? Of where there's different types of leaves and there's different microclimates within the leaves. I, I, I can't provide a flower for the chameleon to go on to, to, you know, catch honeybees all day. I do have dirt and I do have bugs and I do have leaf litter. So it, it, it's trying to fill the niche of diversity of climate with the tools we have. Um, but I focused a little bit more on it actually when considering how to keep uh, the jeweled chameleon first for company, because in particular, those babies and even the adults are actually found in close proximity to the ground uh, somewhat often. So again, I have not been to Madagascar, but I've you know had heard a number of reports and looked into it pretty extensively. And it seems that the babies of many species often do in fact stay near the ground. So Although we think of chameleons as being in high trees, you know, which many of them are, in some circumstances, it seems that the babies and even adults might be found closer to the ground than we thought. So that coupled with using it as a tool to provide more options, I think it justifies its use. Okay. Well, and uh, folks, uh, this, this picture that we're showing here is a baby Campani uh, in one of his enclosures. Let's let's yep. <laughs> let us talk about uh, the special considerations that uh, that bioactive has for raising baby chameleons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this might take me a little bit, but uh, it, when you look at some of these species as babies, you know, in particular, Chilomelanatum uh, or you know, the Campani, it, they're small, right? They're, they're like an inch long. And they know what they're doing, <laughs> despite being so small and fragile looking. They have no parental supervision. No one is teaching them anything. They have everything they need for life, even as such a tiny little animal. And it, it, the reason I think Bioactive has really worked well for raising many of these little tiny babies is because, as I said earlier, it allows for more opportunities for them to regulate and it allows more options for them to take care of themselves. Um, uh, frankly, I don't think I would be able to raise these tiny species in anything but this setup because they're just too small. So it's almost, <laughs> I can't really think of it, think of doing it a different way. If you look at that mm. picture on the left there where they're tucked in the grass, yeah, that's, <laughs> They're using this environment. They're in this super tiny microclimate. And with the approaches I employ, they're able to use every little piece of the enclosure to find what they need at the moment. So for instance, uh, there's springtails in the substrate. I'll talk about that more later, but there's little bugs crawling around in the dirt, for instance. Having a bioactive setup actually encourages and enables these animals to go and find their own prey, to search, oh, I'm gonna go look up on the grass, maybe there's something flying. Oh, I see something down below, I'll go down there. It, it encourages use of the whole system um, for these things if you set it up right. So separate of that though, a rather clear answer I think is just that these are super tiny, as I said. And as a result, or maybe there's some other factors, they desiccate really, really easily. They dry out like that because they're just so tiny. I mean, if you think about the amount of water in an animal that's an inch long, I mean, if you condense that water, it might be a droplet. <laughs> you know, it's there's just not much in them. So having a situation like this or a bioactive setup, I think it enables them to not dehydrate. It enables them to maintain their homeostasis better because they know how to do it. You just need to give them the tools. So I think bioactive setups give them the most tools to be able to take care of themselves. Okay. Well, let's go on to the uh, that taking care of themselves because 
how do you feed in a bioactive setup? And uh, the background be behind that question is, I don't see any food dishes. So it looks like the food is just free roaming. How in the world does that work? Yeah. Um, so it, the way I, as you said, there's no food dishes. There's nothing like that. Um, what I do is I provide a wide diversity of feeder insects that are not harmful to these animals that uh, encourage them to hunt, that encourage them to move around and do things. So I always free range the feeders, but the important thing about the way I set these things up is there's insect communities in or arthropod, um, various <laughs> communities of invertebrates in these systems that are able to be predated. So it's almost as if the entire enclosure is a feeding dish. I have springtails in the substrate, multi, like five different varieties. I have tiny Heidi eye fruit flies that run around. I, sometimes I'll even put a little bit of maybe bee pollen or some, some kind of food for the invertebrates in a corner of the enclosure. So they're all living together. Uh, one thing actually, Carl Katow sort of turned me on to this. I haven't had... Uh, I haven't been able to sustain this, but I had a good stint with it, is aphids. Um, I had aphids growing in these enclosures. And, you know, most people, when they hear, oh, aphids, uh, we need to get rid of it. It's sort of a pest. That was such an advantage for these animals to have that because the aphids were slowing some of the plant growth. They were mm -hmm. always present. The chameleon knew where the aphids were, or they would find them and they'd eat them, right? So it, it, it's... When you don't have a dish, uh, you need to rely on the animals to just find their food on their own. And they they know how to do that. Um, yeah. And, and the one thing that I'm really liking about these very small chameleons is that they are forcing us to see this environment that we have here as, as something that we've got to take care of. We're not taking care of a chameleon mm -hmm. because they're too small to take care of. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taking care of the environment. So the environment takes care of the chameleon. And I think that, uh, that holistic way of thinking is, uh, is where we need to go as herpeticulturists. Very, very well said. I, I absolutely agree. And if you take care of the environment, they can take care of themselves. Right? Our missing piece is that the environment is often hard to identify with the environmental conditions they need is hard to identify, or it's hard to create. But if you give them the options and you give them the opportunity to find what they need, then really you're taking care of an ecosystem and you just, you could put anything in here <laughs> and it would probably do okay um, because it has the option. So, you know, feeding, I've never had an issue with it. I just add the bugs and they will find them. What I'll do mm -hmm. sometimes is I'll sort of let the bugs run out a little bit. And then if I, let's say I really want to give them something with supplements on it, right? I'll, I'll let them kind of pick off most of the bugs around. So there's not that many free ranging fruit flies anymore. And then the next day when they've pretty much eaten most of the stuff in there, then I'll, I know they're hungry. <laughs> and then I'll add some flies to the enclosure, knowing that that's what they're going to be eating. So, so that's well. That brings up an important question. So supplementation, if they're free ranging, there's no supplementation. How do you do the supplementation and do you do supplementation? Yeah. So I, I do supplement. Uh, however, I think that the reason we supplement might not quite track with the, um, what we're trying to actually recreate because calcium, as we know, is important and, you know, dietary D3, it's, kind of up in the air, I suppose. Um, but I try to provide a variety of feeder insects. And when I had things like aphids in there, or even when I have springtails, they are gut loading themselves. They're eating. As I said as well, there's sometimes I leave a little bit of pollen or some kind of food in a corner and the flies will go there and they'll eat it. So the gut loading, I think is quite important, but to supplement and to know that, okay, these animals are getting whatever I'm putting in there, as I said, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, wait a little bit, <laughs> less competition and then add it directly. But uh, frankly, I don't think they need that many supplements. Uh, I think gut loading and diversity of feeders really takes care of a lot of it. 
I really stick to just calcium um, and yeah, maybe some pollen, but to me, that's sort of similar to just gut loading. All right. Well, say we want to start doing this and uh, uh, it seems pretty intimidating when you look at the entire thing to just start. So, uh, but at a high level and, and by the way, people, uh, just to let you know, doing a bioactive setup is going to be a reoccurring theme in my show over this next year. So uh, we're, you're going to get an over new, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to get an overview now, uh, but this is just the start. And so don't, don't stress about it, but uh, let, let's go ahead and give them an overview of what it takes as far as equipment mm -hmm. to successfully do a bioactive. Right. So it, as we'll probably go through a little bit later, there's many different caging approaches for bioactive. You can make, you can turn many different setups into bioactive. So if you get creative, you can sort of make this happen anywhere. But um, as far as actual equipment, in addition to the caging, you need pretty much everything you would need for a more traditional setup. You need adequate lighting. You need some way to ensure humidity and water. Um, but the added component here is that you need to structure the substrate and structure the plants with the understanding that you're trying to provide something of value uh, with everything you add. And it just happens to look good uh, mm -hmm. to me anyway. Yeah. But this is not for your eye. It, it ends up looking good, but it needs to be an approach where you're thinking about everything pretty pretty thoroughly to try to identify what am I adding with this piece? What am I doing with this? What's going to happen in two months time with this piece, right? It, it, you're considering the whole system of the enclosure. So uh, in short, though, you add dirt, <laughs> you add soil, <laughs> you add stuff that gets broken down, you add some kind of drainage system, um, if needed. Um, yeah, it's, it's soil, uh, things that break down, maybe some mineral content, um, the plants, of course, uh, leaf litter is a good addition, mm -hmm. but in addition to that, it's all the typical stuff you'd expect, like lighting, water, and so on. Okay. I want to ask, uh, especially about the hydration cycle mm -hmm. and drainage. Uh, how important is it for the cage to be watertight and is there uh, value in their drainage in the cage? How do we handle drainage? Yeah, so I've tried it a couple of different ways, although most of my keeping, it, it actually, there's been no external drainage. Um, so it, it, I think it is important for it to be watertight. Uh, I've had some times where it, it wasn't quite watertight. It, it was fine because eventually it just kind of got plugged up and it was no longer an issue. But the, the thing with these, you know, it helped. <laughs> uh, the thing with these setups is it, I, I think it, lots of folks aren't used to keeping animals in a setup where there are chameleons in a setup where they don't have to spray for 20 minutes a day. Uh, they actually, it actually requires less input and less water input if it's set up appropriately. So I find that I don't actually need to worry about the drainage that much because I'm not saturating the system. The animals don't seem to need it. Mm -hmm. um, the way I handle the drainage in general, though, is sometimes I'll put those uh, the clay balls at the bottom or some kind of gravel as sort of a drainage layer. So the water can sort of collect down there and stay away from the substrate. And then I'll have a bunch of uh, you know, high quality substrate with certain additives like leaf litter or fur bark and so on that enables water to go through. And then I find that the plants do a really good job keeping the water balance in check since of course they're taking up the water and releasing it as humidity. Um, but I've experimented and I found that in many cases I actually don't need the, the clay balls at the bottom because I'm not hmm. saturating the system. And if you have healthy plant growth and roots down there at the bottom, that is your drainage system in a way, because they take up that water and they just release it back into the environment, especially mm -hmm. with grasses and other plants I use. The root system can be quite extensive and that sort of acts as a buffer for the water. But my major thing I'd say about this is that 
with a bioactive setup, I don't think you really need to be put in a position where you're worrying much about overflow. If it's overflowing, either the system is not established yet, or you might be overwatering. In my experience, right? It, it's maybe there's some species I, I'm not aware of where you need to miss 20 minutes a day still on a bioactive setup. I, I just, I've never encountered that. Okay. So. Well, let's uh, go into, you've actually made a bioactive setup with a Reptibreeze. And so let's go ahead and start at the low end. If someone just wants to put together a bioactive, what they got around, uh, tell us about this system. Yeah. So this is kind of how I got started with bioactive a while ago. Um, so I, I enjoyed this approach and it's been successful for me. Uh, or it's, yeah, it's given me some success and because it's lightweight since it's just this screen enclosure and it, it's cheap. You can just sort of make it yourself. The downside is it does not look as good, I think. And mm. uh, it's, you have to be a little bit creative about how you go about it. So it, the Reptibreeze enclosure is all screen. That's why it's, um, you know, it's, many people use it. It's rather cheap, it's commonly available. So the obvious problem is when converting it to a bioactive setup, is, well, how is the substrate going to stay in there? And there's a few things on the market that attempt to remedy this issue. Like there's a, a big bag sort of that you can sort of fit in the bottom and that kind of works. Uh, there's some people just add the dirt in there and then hope it doesn't come out the sides. I mean, there's lots of ways you can sort of dairy rig it. <laughs> um, I found that the best approach for me is simply buying this corn derived fabric from I get it from Home Depot. Um, but this fabric, for one thing, it's sustainably sourced, but also it's quite a bit of it for quite cheap, and you can simply cut it to size. And that constitutes the bottom and how the substrate gets held in. So, what I do is I just cut it for the bottom and I put it as high up on the sides as I want in order to keep the amount of substrate I want in there. And then the way that this stays is you just cram it full of substrate. So it sort of pushes this fabric to the exterior or rather to the sides of the enclosure, thus forming more or less a seal. It's not watertight, but by stuffing this fabric <laughs> full of dirt and plants, it sort of expands it outward and makes it touch the sides. So you can kind of see it in these pictures. It's it's not the prettiest, and there's usually a little bit of extra fabric that you want to leave um, because it's it's easier to keep track of it that way. And you could, in theory, just pull the entire enclosure out with the fabric. Um, and that's worked very well for me. So it's maintained some aspect of lightweight, but uh, it's relatively cheap. And if you're kind of considering getting into bioactive and you don't know how to start, this is how I did it. Um, I, I think I've come across some better options more recently, but uh, yeah, it gets a job done. Something I also want to mention about these is I don't have any reptibris or rather screen enclosures that don't have some kind of modification to them. Um, mm -hmm. I have a couple outside for, you know, spring, summer, fall, maybe for outside keeping, but that's only transient. Everything that I have long-term in my home I add these panels to the side, which are coroplast panels um, to try to maintain some element of humidity. And then of course I add these bioactive bottoms. So it really, if you go this approach, it's, it's tailoring this product in maybe not such a pretty way to just meet some of the basic requirements, but it's been, it's worked very well for me. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and slam all the way to the other side for a cage that was designed for this and mm -hmm. this is uh, some cages from tamora designs that you made beautiful yeah these have been excellent yeah they all make some some great stuff and this is uh i've really enjoyed working with these enclosures this is really quite a step up from that uh <laughs> from <laughs> yes <laughs> rep debris uh, so these are fully pvc with some screen on the top and then vent holes in the front. So in part, that's sort of what I tried to emulate with my Reptibreeze uh, modification. It's sort of sealing it off so we have more control over the environment. Um, 
these are obviously beautiful and they work very, very well. So you just, you, you know what you're getting. You don't need to modify these. Um, what I've enjoyed working with them as well is that the sizes have worked very nicely for me. Reptibreeze has kind of limited sizes and these come very small. Um, and yeah, they're, they're watertight. And because they have PVC on all the sides, I don't even use drainage layers for most of these. I don't find it necessary. Um, if I okay, let this establish, yeah, they, the plants just take up the water, never had a problem with leaking. Um, I just don't, for most of them, I don't bother with the drainage layer. And I find that the okay. plant roots get to the bottom and they, they do better and they take up more of the water and, uh, yeah, these have worked really well. Uh, okay. The top, of course, you can just add the lights. So. so here is where I'm going to ask the question that's been in my mind all this time. Uh, you have a, a bunch of grasses in there. And uh, how do who, what are those grasses? And how well do they grow in this environment? And what lighting is necessary? Yeah. So the grasses, I think, have been a wonderful addition to how I, how I go about this. And uh in these pictures, uh, I believe that these are, well, so I use a mix of Kentucky bluegrass and more prevalently, uh, little blue stem, which is a native grass to the U.S. Um, so it, every now and then in my yard, I'll have some random grass or some other variety pop up and I can just transplant them. But as my bread and butter, I use Kentucky bluegrass and little blue stem, um, so the grasses do very, very well in these enclosures. Um, and frankly, that's a little surprising to me because many grasses are thought of as uh, just absolute sun loving. You can't put them in partial exactly. shade. I mean, <laughs> they're savannas, right? They're just getting hit by sun all day long. And in fact, in my garden, <laughs> I've I had some struggles planting these exact species or little blue stem in areas that didn't get full sun. So it was sort of just a gamble. Well, maybe they'll work in this environment. And for whatever reason they do. And I think part of it is, is because these are short enclosures. I'm not talking about a four foot tall enclosure. So the lighting I use isn't a high UV index. I'm not trying to burn the babies, of course, but it's close to these plants. So I use a 6,500K kind of bright white bulb plus a UV bulb, and that is way more than sufficient. And these grasses just totally take off. Frankly, I think it would work with just one of those bulbs. Um, okay. So they don't need any kind of special lighting and they sprout up. And it, whether this is ideal for the grass, I don't know. <laughs> but if there's a clear light source above, the grasses tend to just go straight up like that. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they're able to survive in this environment. That's really good because it fills up the enclosure. Mm -hmm. So it, it works very well. It's super cheap to buy just a 20 pound bag of grass seeds oh, wow. and then that forever. <laughs> you don't need that many, <laughs> but it's, it, it's worked phenomenally and they do very well with pretty much basic lighting. Um, so, okay. Well, let's go ahead and do a step-by-step -step of what you do to build this. And uh, we're going to be using a Leap Habitats cage uh, for people. These are actually uh, in uh, uh, available, very limited, but it's going to, I believe it's going to be at the end of March or beginning of April. These will be available widespread. At least that's the information that I have right now. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, tell us a little bit about this cage, and then in the next few slides, we're going to do a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial. Sure. Yeah, so it really, the, I love the leap habitats, and one of the reasons is is because this is always what my, my rep debris modification was meant to be, right? <laughs> this is what I was always trying to get to, and it's just already built in. So that's really nice. That's always what I was trying to emulate. And I don't want to talk too bad about rep debris because they have their place and they, you know, I've been successful with them, but this is just, it's been quite an upgrade compared to mm -hmm. my <laughs> dabbling with modification. So basically it's PV or it's a similar kind of coroplast material on the sides. It's a hybrid enclosure with some nice uh, ventilation at the bottom. So it's yeah, lightweight 
worked really well. Um, and I think it's a really good candidate for bioactive setups as well, um, which is, I, I think, quite an advantage of uh, of using them. Okay. Well, this is bare bones. So uh, let's go ahead and just uh, give us a tour as to how you put these together. Right. So in this case, I did add a drainage layer just to try it out. And plus it's just diversity of substrate, as I said, might not be necessary. Um, probably isn't in fact, but um, I wanted to give it a go. So on the left there, that's just the enclosure with some of that uh, expanded clay at the bottom. Then I added some of this nice substrate, um, fir bark and all this other good stuff, also from Leap. Um, but what I always add, no matter what substrate I'm using, is a leaf litter uh, kind of at the beginning. It's not only for the surface, um, as far as my usage has been. So I add the leaf litter in with the dirt and I kind of mix it up. And mm -hmm. once I get you know, maybe a, a couple inches worth of this soil um, leaf litter mix, I add some grass seeds and maybe it's a little hard to see on the side but on the right um, if you zoom in a lot or if you look real close you can see that there's quite a few grass seeds i put in there as well as some peas um well peas that's a seed i mean and uh, when i do that i find that if i add seeds along the way worst case is they never germinate and then there's simply more organic material to break down best case, as the system turns over, those seeds that were originally at the bottom or obscured get brought closer to the surface, mm -hmm. they get more light, and they bloom, or they grow, they sprout. So by adding components like that at every step, even though this is still somewhat the bottom, uh, it encourages the system to spring into life no matter what stage it's at because you're seeding it throughout the entire system and the process okay mm -hmm. so then uh yeah so then i i even though i rely heavily on grasses and pea shoots and things like that i, I find it valuable to add maybe at least uh, usually one maybe two kind of more traditional plants to give some diversity of the plants available to the animals. So in this case, this is for pygmy chameleons, actually. This is for, for Kizia stumpy. So I'm not relying quite as heavily on grass um, at this point in, in this enclosure. So I had a few more plants than I would normally add at the beginning. But the idea is you add them in, make sure the soil is not full of pesticide or uh, you know fertilizer or anything like that. Um, and then just mix in the soil from the plant pot. That's usually what I do into this, um, this mixture and sort of start trying to find where you want to put them. Um, and then if we go to the next one, uh, what I do is then I add the leaf litter on top. I add another layer of seeds, right? Grass seeds and pea plants that will be sprouting sooner because they're near the surface. Um, then I add the sticks and add the lighting. So uh, throughout the process, I'm adding some seeds, some stuff to break down. I mix all the leaf litter in. I top it off with some leaf litter as well. And one thing I'll mention about the leaf litter is I use a diversity of different leaves. So I use some deciduous maple from my yard. I use some live oak. I use uh, some ash tree I, I use different types of leaves because I find there, I think it's probably just well known, different leaves degrade at different rates and they have different nutrients. Um, some of them do. For instance, the African giant millipede, one of the major hurdles in breeding them has been that uh, they don't lay the eggs appropriately or they, uh, th this matters, I promise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they have problems reproducing and we've found that, um, from some work some zoos have done, if we add oak leaf litter in particular, that helps them produce the eggs and it helps them reproduce successfully. So not all leaves are created equal. And mm -hmm. I don't know what my springtails want that day. So adding different types of leaves and different types of things that could be broken down, like seed husks, um, that just contributes to the system. Okay. Now, uh, in all of this, we haven't even touched on the invertebrates. Uh, mm -hmm. So let, let's let's close off with how do you uh, what do you use and how do you add them? 
Right. So I tend to add springtails primarily. And in fact, I add as many different varieties of springtails as I can. When people talk about bioactive, it's it, pretty frequently it's uh, let's add springtails. And that works. But in reality, there's very different species of springtails. And I think they do somewhat different things. There's giant springtails that are not really big, but <laughs> bigger. Uh, there's tiny springtails that are kind of silver in color. There's uh, temperate springtails. There's uh, lots of different types. And so what I do is I add at least five different types of springtails. I think that really changes the environment and makes a better sort of community. In addition to that, um, when I bring in these leaves from outside here, they come with them or what comes with them is kind of natural fungi and bacteria and things like that. And for this living system, that's usually a good thing. It can be pathogenic, but I've not encountered that. Okay. When you take things from outside that aren't sterilized, you're inoculating your system. Um, so sometimes I'll add these little, uh, I forget where it comes from, but it's like these little packets that are supposed to contain certain mycorrhizae and uh, beneficial bacteria. It might be, might be necessary, might not. I've, I've never done a controlled experiment, <laughs> but fungi and bacteria are a kind of, key part of this system and when i'm first setting these up uh sometimes i'll even see a mushroom sprout and that's okay. a good sign as far as i'm concerned but as far as the bugs um I, I said that because there's probably some other little native springtails or other bugs that come in when i take things from outside um sometimes i'll have, add a small red wiggler worm or two just to kind of keep the soil churning um now isopods are <laughs> they're a contentious issue for me because I've had some unfortunate results keeping isopods and then some positive results otherwise. So I would say if you're keeping Burkigia, do not use isopods. Uh, that's just my experience, but I've had a couple times where I, the fresh, you know, batch of some Burkigia eggs got laid and the spring, the isopods came over and chewed a hole in the egg. Mm. And that was really unfortunate. Um, also, when we're talking about these chameleons that are an inch long, uh, it, isopods can be predators in a way. Okay. They're, I, I've seen them crawling up on the branches at night, and I don't think this would bother a large chameleon. But when you're talking an animal that's the size of a large isopod, it makes me uneasy <laughs> to have them in that enclosure. So I try to rely more heavily on the fungi, the bacteria, and a wide diversity of springtails um with maybe a, a worm or two uh in the past i've actually had some success with very tiny snails and okay. even slugs but the problem with slugs and snails is again such tiny chameleons uh if they crawl on the chameleon and get the the slime on their face for instance i've had a case where that happened and one of them it it sort of closed up the nose and it just wasn't super good. So with this bioactive setup, uh, it's an ecosystem and there can be predators in the ecosystem and there's all these interactions you need to consider. Um, so yeah, in, in short, springtails, um, lo lots of them, bacteria, fungi, maybe a worm or two. Isopods, I think, work well in certain conditions where you're like live bearers. They work great for Eliotai because they just, eat the, the feces and they turn up the system and they're great. But just know that they can be a hassle and they can be predators in the right circumstance. Okay. All right, uh, folks, we're going to turn this over for questions and answers. Oh. And so uh, go ahead and uh, put whatever uh, questions you want in the, uh, in the chat and we will take a look. And while, peop while people are putting that together, uh, have you used uh, bioactive with larger species like panthers or jacksons? Um, well, so I've used them in enclosures big enough for a jacksons or panthers. Um, we have a pretty nice, it's, uh, what are the dimensions? It's like three feet tall and, and a couple feet wide. So it's maybe on the smaller side for a jacksons or panther, but um, that's worked fine. Uh, I've not used it for veils or panthers 
themselves, but I've used them in enclosures that could conceivably contain one. <laughs> okay. uh, it works, right? I think it works well. The only downside and why I don't, I don't have it for my Parsons, for instance, or my Christopher, rather. The only downside for me is that it's just, it's just heavy. You know, it, it's, okay. if it's a screen enclosure that you're jerry rigging, especially, then having that much soil in the bottom can kind of warp the panel a little bit if you want to move it. It's, I'd say if you want to go bigger, just really commit and buy a hybrid enclosure that's made for bioactive. My jerry rigging approach can work. I don't really like it because I feel like it's taxing the enclosure too much when it's so big. Okay. Yeah. All right. What kind of projects do you have ahead of you? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. I have quite a few, I hope. I, I'm really hoping for a male um, Chris, person, Christopher, to try to uh, pair up these two females. Um, I'm okay. trying to work with Kaluma Ro Loco, which is really, I mean, it, it's a absolutely stunning chameleon. It's the smallest true chameleon from Madagascar. It looks a little bit like the blue nose is the Lenatum, but it's, well, it's beautiful. You have to just look it up, but I'm, I'm really trying hard to get a group of those. And um, they have a very small habitat range and anyone that comes in, I think we really need to focus on making sure that they reproduce because it's very, very limited um, what's possible. But I have some first for minor eggs as well from a few different bloodlines that are probably, hopefully will hatch in a couple of weeks. Um, I have some lateralis going, of course. I'm sorry. The question was, what do I have ahead of me? Not what I have going on. So ahead of me <laughs> is uh, the Christophers. Um, I've been interested in the Antimana chameleons as well. Uh -huh. uh, one pairing uh, a little while ago, but I'm trying to get a few more of those. Um, I'm trying to expand my Burkizia stumpy uh, population a little bit more, uh, as well as first of her will I have a, a couple of good pairings um, and hopefully get eggs pretty soon. Uh, yeah. So I'm trying to work okay. with a number of new species. <laughs> Oops. Wait a minute. Here's a, here's a question from Chris Young asking what kind of timeline should we expect from initial setup to fully functioning bioactive system? Right. Yeah. So that's a good, good point. Um, another nice thing about the grass is that they grow fast. It fills in very quickly um, and they grow you know, like weeds because they kind of are. Um, so uh, with a, when I have a heavily grass and, and pea oriented uh, enclosure, you know, the pea shoots and everything, really maybe a couple weeks. I mean, okay. and frankly, during that time, if you add sticks and maybe one uh, larger plant, frankly, I, I keep the chameleons in there during that startup process. Um, mm -hmm. It's if you give them enough, it's, it's fine. But you know, about two weeks, I'd say is typically how long it takes me to get it all cycled. I mean, ideally a month because then the springtails multiply and it's, it, you know, you don't have any more fungus nap blooms, hopefully, but I think two weeks is kind of my cutoff where I say like, this is, this is a system now. Um, it's okay. Probably, okay. Okay. We have a number of questions about substrate. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the one from Craig Durbin mm -hmm. uh, asking, are we using ABG mix or mm -hmm. mixing your own? Yeah. Well, so recently I've been using uh, the, the leap substrate, which has been really nice. It's, uh, you know, it has a good composition of, I think, fur bark and some a little bit of sphagnum maybe, but uh, yeah, it's, that's been really nice. It's somewhat similar to the ABG mix, but it doesn't have the peat moss, which is, kind of a non-sustainable resource. So ideally we don't, I don't use it that much, but uh, yeah, I'll use ABG mix from time to time though. Uh, and no matter what substrate I use, I do modify it. I modify it by adding in that leaf litter and churning it up and adding the seeds. So I always sort of mix it. It's never just an add, add and, you know, just set it and forget it. Um, but so, yeah. What is important about a substrate? What, what should we look for? Yeah. Um, well, since I often don't use a real drainage system, I just kind of let the plants take care of it or maybe some clay balls. Uh, it needs to drain well. It can't just puddle. 
that's a death sentence. It, it, it's I tried just topsoil one time and that was horrible because it, mm. it it wouldn't it would just pool on top and then the rest of the substrate would remain dry. So it would just puddle. And that okay. is horrible. That was like if that happens, you need to change substrate right away because <laughs> that was really not good. Um, I, I sometimes I'll add a little bit of sand to improve the drainage. But basically, I want good drainage. Right. Okay. I want good drainage and I want diversity of materials in the soil so that more stuff can break down, more air pockets can op open up and so on. So it's drainage, diversity of material, um, and, you know, easy to work with. Okay. So. All right. Well, I promise to get you out of here in an hour, and uh, <laughs> we, I'm right on time. I, how in the world did that work? <laughs> uh, but we do have, okay, you, we, I have four more minutes, and so mm -hmm. let us, do one last one last question. Chris Young is asking, do you ever find it necessary to feed your custodians? Yeah, good question. So uh, mm -mm, this is actually really, really good. You brought that up. So if someone might add, one might wonder, well, OK, there's all this grass growing. Well, what happens in the summer when we have grass growing? People tend to mow the grass, right, because it gets out of control. So what I do is I just go in with some scissors and I just trim everything in the enclosure when needed. And I let all of that just fall to the ground. Um, and that creates a new microclimate of free, you know, freshly fallen plant material. So when I do that, it really, I remove nothing from the system and the custodians just go to town on it. Um, okay. So occasionally, as I said, if I have like fruit flies in the enclosure, I'll add maybe a little bit of food for them, like pollen or whatever, a little, some calcium thing and of course the custodians will help themselves <laughs> but i don't really add anything extra because i just build in so many different nutrients with the seeds and the, the plants and just leaving the trimmings in and poop and everything that they do fine without any real concerted effort as far as feeding them goes okay mm -hmm. all right thank you very michael i want to say thank you very much for coming on and and sharing uh, this introduction this has been a wonderful episode thank you well thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it uh yeah I, i'm happy to come on again if needed uh yeah thanks again we're gonna be doing bioactive a lot <laughs> because this is just fun and there's just so much for us to explore in uh in helping with some of these hard to raise species and so this is just a natural extension of where we need to go. Mm -hmm. so, all right, world, digital world, we'll see you later. Uh, we're planning on doing this every Saturday and uh, got next Saturday's uh, worked out. And so uh, we will see you then. Bye, all. Thanks.